It's my, uh, my pleasure to introduce Gerhard Krieger uh, from DLR, who will be presenting on bi-static and multi-static SAR, uh, state of the art and future developments. Uh, take it away. Okay, then thank you again for the invitation, Adasti. So it's a pleasure to give here the presentation on say the opportunities of bi-static and multi-static are the challenges, and maybe it's also give you a glimpse into future developments. Of course, the time is limited, so it can be only at a bit of superficial level, but nevertheless, I think I can address some interesting topics for you all. So let me start first with, I say, clarification of some notions, um, say, which I will also use in this presentation. So bi-static radar systems um, will have a separation between the transmitter and receiver, so they will be on different platforms. And multi-static systems will call systems that have not only one receiver, but multiple receivers also distributed on multiple platforms. And maybe I'll start here with the pointer. Okay, and say these kind of bi-static and multi-static systems can be further um, say, distinguished into fully active systems. So here each satellite or each platform has both transmit and receive capabilities. And examples are here Tandem X, Texat 21 or Tandem L, and semi-active systems. Here we have one dedicated transmitter and one or more passive receivers. The advantage here for the semi-active system is that you can have, these receivers can be much cheaper, they don't need a transmitter. On the other hand, you have, of course, um, trouble, for example, if the transmitter fails. So you're de dependent on the transmitter. You don't have here redundancy. In the case of the fully active system, if one satellite fails, you have still maybe these other two here in this case. So you are not completely lost. So each of these configurations has its pros and cons. Okay, when we talk about bi-static and multi-static SAR, we have in mind, of course, all these opportunities that arise from separation of the transmitter and receiver satellites. And on this slide, you see just some examples, which I will, be, will address also. Some of them I will address in more detail within this presentation. And maybe the on start, let me start on the upper left. So here we have multi-static SAR imaging. So we can um, see the, say, the reflected wave from the ground, not only in, in the uh, direction of transmission, but also in many other directions. And I will address this in more detail later on. Another opportunity is cross-track interferometry, for example, to generate higher resolution digital elevation models on a global scale. We can use a long track interferometry to measure, up, for example, currents on the, on the ocean or some other movements. We can um, also detect, um, observe traffic with moving target indication by using multiple satellites in a parasitic configuration. We can um, use the system for frequent monitoring, for wide swaths imaging. We can also use super resolution techniques to um, acquire more information about scatterers and to enhance the resolution by this. We can even implement SAR tomography in space. And there are many, many opportunities here listed on the right. And um, so you will see some examples in the presentation in more detail. But this should give you a first glimpse about the manifold opportunities you have with this bi-static and multi-static synthetic aperture radar. Say on this slide, you see just a small subset of mission, multi-static missions that have been proposed or implemented. So here you see on the upper left, Texat 21, which was one of the first multi-static SAR missions proposed in 2000. So this uh, is a fully active configuration with eight satellites in this case. And the main, there, there were many goals of these missions, but the main objective was um, coherent location on, of objects. Then there was from Italy, the so-called BISAT proposal. So this, uh, the idea was to have a, a semi-active system. The idea was to have um, the Cosmos Skymed Sky satellite 
expand radar satellite, illuminate the scene, and to collect the scattered waves with a um, with a passive receiver here. And the goal were also many many different biostatic observations, for example, of the radar chromatry. Then um, there was this most time mix that had been proposed in 2004. And it had been launched then, 2010. It was the first bi-state exam mission in space. And so it was, it was a fully active system with two almost identical satellites flying in close formation. And the main objective here is, was, is and was um, to acquire a global digital elevation model with high unprecedented unprecedented resolution. Then there was another proposal from, from Germany, the so-called Tandem L mission. This is an l band SAR with two satellites, very powerful satellites that employ also digital beamforming. You have here these large reflectors, so diameter 15 meters. So it, um, with the system, you can really map the, the whole Earth interferometrically on a weekly basis. Then there was from, from China, the launch of LUTAN-1. It's an l band tandem configuration. Um, and say this is maybe the late, um, also a, a very interesting system, and we're looking forward to see the first first uh, results from this mission, and, and probably in the next conferences. And then there's another proposal. It's Harmony. It's for the Earth Explorer 10, and the idea here is to um, amend the uh, Sentinel-1 satellite, shown in the middle, by two passive receivers. Flying here information, maybe both on the same side or one or the, on the opposite sides here. And there are also many um, goals of this mission, for example, to get the generation models, but also to observe, um, say, get velocity vectors in um, two dimensions. Okay, but just to be clear, these are only, say, some examples out of maybe a, a set of 20 or more mission proposals, which have been yeah, put forward over the last 20 years. Okay, let me start a bit about, bit, bit about more details about bi-static and multi-static SAR imaging. So the idea is really to extend the observation space provided by monostatic SAR by collecting the scattered waves, not only backward to the satellite, to the transmitting satellite, but also in other directions. By this, we get much more information about the scattering characteristics, and it can be improved for um, to can be used to improve the detection, segmentation, and classification in SAR images. It can be used to monitor um, velocity measurements in 2D and 3D, for example, multidimensional ocean wave spectra, as proposed for Harmony. Can be used to separate different scattering mechanisms, for example, coherent from non-coherent components. Also, it allows for permittivity roughness separation. Can be used for radar chromatography and multi-shadow evaluations, and you can also use reduced speckle without a degradation of the resolution by using by, by combining images with multiple incident angles, for example. And here you see an example, and quite early example from 2003. So it was an experiment which has been conducted together in a cooperation between ONERA, French um, research organization, and DLR. So you see here the two airplanes here flying in there. And so, um, we had several different configurations here. And say one example are these cross-track configurations shown here with varying biostatic angles. And you see here a color composite of three biostatic images with different biostatic angles, as indicated here on the upper right. Here the green, blue, and red. And each of these images given a different color, but you see here is a comp composite. And you see here the, say, the great information increase provided by this biostatic measurements. Since, as say, you wouldn't have an information increase, you would get still a grayscale image here, but the different colors indicate the different scattering um, and the different scattering pronunciation for the different biostatic angles. You see here many interesting details. For example, you see all the color in the shadows, just due to this biostatic configurations. 
you see the different the fields in different colors and so on. So this is very interesting and it shows you the great benefit you can get from observations with multiple biostatic angles. Here's another example, which is shown from Terrasa X or the Tandem X mission. So here the two satellites flew at a distance of 20 kilometers. And we made here this uh, monostatic acquisition and the bistatic acquisition here. The angle is pretty small. The bistatic angle is only two degrees. But nevertheless, you get here already quite interesting differences between the monostatic and bistatic image. So the monostatic image is shown in magenta and the bistatic image in green. You can here see here the green colors here. For some scatterers, for some here, this is houses. It's Brazil, Brazil, Brasilia in Brazil. So you see here the houses here in red color. So they are stronger in the monostatic image. Also very interesting result. Shows you the additional information you get already in the small bisatic angles. And even with smaller bisatic angles, you can get pretty interesting results. So this is from a recent paper from um, University of, of, of Zurich, ETH Zurich. And you see here, it's a plot. So this is this where you compare the, the amplitude or intensity, backscatter intensity of a monostatic and a bistatic image. And the bistatic image is um, taken with a very small bistatic angle. So we're talking about bistatic angles of 0, 0.0 up to 0, 0.2 degrees. And you see here systematic drop of the magnitude of the bistatic image with increasing bistatic angle. And it's an area which has been observed. It's the Alec Glacier in Switzerland. And it's, uh, say, in this case, for the dark, here for the, for the, for the bright dots here, the blue dots, was co covered with dry fern. And here for the, for the dark blood dots here, with wet snow. You see the systematic drop, especially for the dry snow coverage. And say, you can explain this by an interesting effect, the so-called coherent backscatter enhancement, which may provide up to three dB um, difference between the monostatic and small angle bistatic scattering. And this is due to the reciprocity of the paths you get in multi, multiple scattering here in volumes. It's a pretty interesting effect, and it may help also to better understand the scattering in volumes and the associated effects. Also, pretty new observation you can make with this biostatic systems. Still another experiment which has been conducted 15 years ago. This is a hybrid biostatic SAR experiment in X-band. So we use Terrasa X as an illuminator. We had the airborne system from DLR as a receiver. And by this, we could produce this biostatic SAR images. And you see here an example. So here, this is a bistatic image. This is range, this is azimuth. But you see here bright, this is the antenna pattern of the receiver, which is much smaller than of the transmitter. So Terrasa X illuminates of a 30 kilometer wide source. Here we see a three kilometer wide source from the FSAR, from this um, receiver system. And say you could look into this um, image and compare, for example, a monostatic image from Terrasa with the bistatic image here from this um, from acquired with the airborne system and here an optical image. And there are also interesting differences here. Maybe it's just to show you one detail. Here you see a fans in a monostatic image. It's a metal fans. And you don't see it in the biostatic image here. It's completely absent. And this is just to the, uh, to the double bound scattering here in the monostatic image and which is very directive in the biostatic, it's absent here. It's just one, um, say, example, what you can see, what is the difference between the monostatic and biostatic imaging, but in the biostatic image, you see other details, which are also pretty interesting. Okay, good. This gives you maybe a first hint, say, what you can do um, with biostatic systems for maybe multi-angular imaging. Another opportunity is single pass cross track interferometry. For this, let me just recall the basic principle. 
So here, what you have here are two antennas. They are separated by a baseline B. And these antennas could be either on a single platform, like in this um, shuttle radar topography mission here, where we had this uh, 60 meter baseline, this here between the transmit and receive antenna and here receive only antenna. Or the, the antennas could be on two satellites, here separated by this baseline B. Here the advantage is that it's very flexible to select this baseline. I could also use larger baselines than the 60 meters here. And what is, if you think now about a point on the ground, you have maybe these two ranges. And if you have a different height here and keep the range here from the um, here constant for the first receiving antenna here, same range, you will observe for the second antenna different range here. And this range difference here is directly proportional to the height here, delta H. And this you can measure, say, with an accuracy, with a millimetric accuracy in the SAR system by exploiting interferometry. And it's clear that the, as the larger the baseline becomes, the more change you have here, that is the more sensitive you will be to height changes. Okay, one mission which uses this principle is Tandemix. So it was the first bi-static SAR mission in space launched in 2010. So the first satellite had already been launched in 2007, the second satellite in 2010. And since then, they acquire bi-static data on a global scale. The main goal is the acquisition of a global digital elevation model with unprecedented accuracy. But there are also several other demonstrations of innovative bi-static imaging techniques and applications. And Tandem X is an acronym in the end for Terrasa add-on for digital elevation measurements. T-A-D-E-M. Okay, the data acquisition in Tandem X can in principle be made in several different modes, three are shown here. So we could have a so-called posit monostatic mode. So that the two satellites operate independently of each other, but they have to be separated by several kilometers in order to avoid mutual interferences. You can use the bi-static mode, here, one satellite transmits and both receive simultaneously, or you can use the um, alternating bi-static mode. Now here, one satellite transmits, both receive, and then next pulse, the other satellite transmits, both receive, then, then again, the first satellite transmits, both receive, and so on. And each of these modes has its advantages and disadvantages. And say, maybe the simplest mode would be the pursuit monostatic mode with the separation here. But this is, has, say, some, some problems, which we also observed in the early phase of Tandemix. So here, what you see are three times acquisitions of a digital elevation model here. And what you see here is the coherence. So white means good. It's a high coherence, close to one. Black means low coherence, close to zero. Since here, say, if you have a black area, it's difficult to, to get a DAM and the accuracy would be, would be pretty poor. And these acquisitions were made here, um, say, uh, with, 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 say um, several, with, with several cycles separated here, but with different, very, very similar acquisition geometries. And you see here that even already with a small distance between satellites of only 20 kilometers, you can have for some periods of, of time, you can have poor conditions here due to wind and maybe also due to, to rain. And say by this, um, say you get here this decorrelation effect, this temporal decorrelation effect, and this makes it really difficult to get a um, high resolution dam. And you can only avoid this if you have a, a closer, a longer distance here, not 20 kilometers, but maybe only a few hundred meters. And for this, you need the bi-static mode. So here only one satellite transmits, both receive, you have the additional advantage that you need only one transmitter, so you make a dual use of the signal energy, which was also important in Tandem X. But the great uh, challenge here is that you need really a good synchronization between the satellites. And we'll talk about synchronization later on. But first, I would like to show you some results. You see here is a global digital elevation model, which has been acquired by Tandem X between 2010 and 2015. 
So the horizontal resolution is 12 by 12 meters, and the vertical accuracy is one meter, typically in some areas is only two meters. It depends a bit on the terrain type. But a very good accuracy, well within the specifications, which we had before. And it has really a high quality, um, which say is also now used by many scientists worldwide. And you can not only acquire digital one digital elevation model with a system like Tandem X, but you can also monitor height changes. So what you see here is an example of the rice grow in an area between near Greece and Turkey. At the border at uh, Greece and Turkey. And you see how the rice, rice paddies here, you see the grow of the rice over a season. So it's here roughly a season of, of, of a few months. Here you see how the height changes, maybe from zero, zero meter up to 1.4 meters. So it's pretty interesting as an observation, uh, say, where, where you can use this, uh, say, single pass biostatic interferometric systems. Another example you can see here, it's, uh, say, an area in Alberta, Canada. It's an, oil, uh, an area where, 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 you, um, where oil sand, sand mining is um, performed. And you see here the changes. So this is 2012. So topography here goes from roughly 230 meters up to 370 meters. And um, you see here this topography 2012 and then 2016. You see how the changes from 2012, 2016, then 2018, and 2021. So also here, this is the changes are very interesting to observe, and they can be used also for several purposes. Still another example. So here you see on a larger scale the height changes observed with tandem X over the northern Patagonian ice field. So there are changes between 2012 and 2016. What you see is the elevation change rate in meters per year. So the scale goes from minus 10 meters up to plus 10 meters here. And you see here this changes with minus 10 meters here every year. So it's a dramatic loss of ice, which can be observed here. And that's data also very interesting, of course, in the context of climate change studies and the impact. And you can do even more by adding a polarization. So what you see here is a polarimetric SAR, SAR uh, say, what you see here is say the high changes you would observe by changing the polarization. Here by say changing the polarization, you see different heights of the phase center. Since you have different scattering properties, you have for one polarization, you're more close to the ground, with maybe the, the cross polarization, cross polarized comets, you're more close to the, say, to the top of a vegetation layer. And this can be observed. And just one example here, also for tandem X, is here, it was only a dual pol polarized acquisition. You see here the difference between the horizontal and vertical polarization. And also here you can observe height differences in the order um, between zero meter and three meter in these examples. Okay, another option is a long track interferometry and ground moving target indication. The basic idea here is that you have two observations separated in time. So here you measure first the range to a scatterer here R, and if the scatterer moves and you have a second measurement, then you get here a, 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 a longer range in this example. And from this, you can then derive the velocity of the scatterer. And this has, for example, been used to observe tidal currents. In this example here, it's an area in um, the northern mainland of Scotland. And, it's, uh, and there is, uh, say, this um, water strait where you can see here this, this velocities here observed with tandem X here on uh, here in the direction, um, downward direction, downward range direction. So away from the radar and the upward range, the range direction towards the radar at two different times. So these are tidal currents and they flow in different directions depending on the tidal um, position. Another example here observed, um, with tandem X um, uh, in the east of Greenland. 
So it's this, uh, say, are these ice flows what you observe here? So this, the, 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 this ice flows move on the on the on the um, sea, and what you see here are the fringes here, and they are not due to the linear movement, but due to, to a rotation of these ice flows. So the fringe right here gives the indication of the rotation, and to show you the sensitivity you can get here. Um, is you get here this uh, the estimated ice rotation in two seconds here with very small degrees here. So what you can measure in in fact is an accuracy of time, ten rise to the power of minus five degrees per second, or you could also say there's a single rotation of such an ice flow within one year, and you can measure it only in this three seconds time difference. Also, this shows you the power of interferometry and the sensitivity you can get here. Another example is traffic monitoring. So you can have a first SAR image, then a second delayed SAR image. You can um, compare these images, and from this you can derive the velocities of the objects, or maybe rotation of the objects. And you get, get also very accurate results here in the order of 0 0.2 meters per second. Okay, let me talk a little bit about the challenges. So there are many challenges to implement bi-static and multi-static SAR missions in space. And say you have, here also you see some examples. You have to find safe formations to fly satellites in close formation. You have to synchronize systems. You have to estimate the baselines here, which can be maybe done with, with um, sophisticated GPS data evaluations. You have to calibrate the system. And you have many, many more challenges, which I would not like to well, I don't have the, the time to go into this, but uh, let me show some examples. So one is, first is you have to find suitable formations to fly the, the satellites together. And what you see here is uh, an early proposal already, say, from 1989 by Philip Hartle and also from Howard Sepka, 1992, the so-called pendulum. And the problem with this configuration is that you have here at the northern and southern turns, the orbits cross, and you don't have baselines, and even more, you have the risk that the two satellites may collide there. And this is say, um, difficult, especially you have no, say, no autonomous formation flying by the satellites. So a more safe configuration, so-called helix satellite formation. Here you have, in addition, you choose slightly uh, um, Elliptical orbits, and um, by this you can have here a radial distance here also at the northern and southern turns. And by this you get a baseline first, also to map the northern areas or the southern areas. But you have also the advantage that now the orbits don't cross. You get the so-called helix formation here relative to satellites um, from this helix, as shown here. Maybe it can also be seen in this animation. You see here really what this is how the satellites here, the orbits never cross. And how they move about each other here in this say in the Cidic formation. So the one in the end the one forms an ellipse around the other satellite if you look more closely to it. So you get say for all latitudes, you get always a suitable baseline to map to make for interfer interferometric mapping. Okay, another challenge in tandem X is the synchronization. So here, in, um, you have the typically the problem in a biostatic system that you use one oscillator to generate your radar pulses, to transmit them to the ground, to receive them. You have to demodulate them before you can store them in memory. And for the demodulation, you use another oscillator. And if they are not coupled, you will end up with notable errors. And um, say, in order to avoid this problem, um, there have been proposed many different solutions, some of which you see on this in the next slide. So you could have a ex continuous exchange between the user signals, between the satellites, but there have problems maybe here um, from, if you have a low frequency signal from the ionosphere and so on. So there could, can be several problems here. Another proposal was the exchange of radar pulses between the satellites. Um, this has also been used in tandem mix. You can use, say, very stable oscillators, so-called hyperstable oscillators, and then 
um, have some ground control points, then you could also resolve this issue of the synchronization. You could have uh, this so-called alternating transmit mode. I had introduced this shortly before. You could have first one satellite transmits, then both receive, then the other satellites transmits, both receive, and so on. But this, you can also achieve a synchronization of the system. And then there are some more sophisticated solutions. You could um, um, make your synchronization based on, say, GNSS data. So you have you observe the wave fields in the end of, of the GNSS data, and by, by an appropriate evaluation, you can get both uh, this precise baseline, but also um, you can synchronize the time here with a high accuracy. There are solutions in a MIMO um, system where you can exploit the wave number shift, as illustrated here. There is also, say, some database synchronization technique, which has been developed by Marco Rodriguez Cosola at DLR. So it's here, say, the idea to use some sub apertures and combine them in the end, and from this to get a database synchronization. And there's also a proposal, another proposal from DLR, the so called Mirasa. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Okay, in tandem mix, so we used this um, exchange of radar pulses for synchronization. And you see here on the right the performance estimation what we had. So it depends how often you exchange the synchronization pulses between the satellites. But say what we had predicted is roughly that we would get phase errors in the order of a degree or so from this synchronization scheme. And what we got in the very beginning was not this one degree, but we got, say, much higher errors. So you see here this undulations of a digital elevation model, which has been acquired over Salar de Uyuni in Bolivia. So it's a flat area. And you see here in the digital elevation model, this waves here. So this is azimuth direction, this is range direction, and you see here this waves. And these are due to, a, say, some errors in the synchronization. You can see them even more clearly in the interferogram. So you have here, say, this phase arrow in the end of 15 degree, which is much higher, a lot of magnitude higher than the one degree we had predicted. And the reason was that there was an error in this evaluation of the synchronization pulses. And say this error has been resolved. And if you do it in the correct way, these this undulations are gone. And you see here, this, uh, the remaining undulations, if you see them at all, are maybe below 0 0.1 meter. And by this, you can show that the synchronization accuracy is now in the order of one degree or better. So it's a very, say, astonishing result. And it tells you, say, if you um, think about time, it means you have synchronized, synchronized the system with an accuracy of 0 0.3 picoseconds. Another challenge in tandem mix especially, but also for future other missions, is the calibration, bicycle calibration. And here what you see on the left side here, this was in the beginning. So we had some calibration test sites where we knew the height of these sites. And from this, we could conclude on the baseline, the, say the, 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 the errors we will have in the interferogram. And you see here these baseline errors we had in the beginning. So this is the error of the effective phase center in the end of them, which you would um, assume if you had, say, if you knew the, the um, height of a terrain, here both in the radial and the cross track direction, and you see these errors are in the order of uh, 40 millimeters plus minus 40 millimeters. And this means you would have height errors of several tens of meters. And after several yeah, months or maybe even a year or two of, say, um, analysis and, and experiments and so on, we got down here to an error of, say, one, one millimeter or 1.3 1, 1 millimeters in the cross track and radial directions here. And um, this means that in the end, we can really get the digital elevation models with an absolute height accuracy in the order of one meter. So one millimeter error typically corresponds to one meter height error. And there were many aspects involved in this calibration. You see listed some of them here. 
Just to show you some examples, which you maybe also, which we did not expect in the beginning. So there were some systematic errors. So we had, for example, like the height error dependent on the long trick baseline between the satellites, and it caused for several months confusion where this comes from. So you see here is the systematic change of the phase here with the long trick distance. So you have here, of course, the ambiguity in the phase. So you see it several times. But this is, say, um, you see the, the dependence. And the reason in the end was that we performed the synchronization in one reference frame, but the SAR processing in a different reference frame. So the synchronization is performed in the satellite frame and the SAR processing in the Earth-centered, Earth-fixed reference frame. And these frames move with respect to each other. And by this, two events which are simultaneous in the satellite reference frame are no longer simultaneous in the Earth-centered, Earth-fixed reference frame, as illustrated here. And by this, you get the systematic offsets this, uh, um, which depend on the distance between the satellites. So it's in the end a relativistic effect. And say, if you, um, if you say account for this, then you can remove a good deal of these variations we had seen before. Another thing, which was also not considered in the beginning, I say what we had observed here is systematic, we had systematic trends with the incident angle. So, so for near, near range swaths, we got here minus two meters, and for the far range swaths, we got here plus two meters roughly. And the reason in the end was also that we have here also differential tropospheres, tropospheric delays. So the way here through the troposphere is a little bit longer for one satellite than for the other. And this causes these height shifts. And if you correct for it, then these trends are gone. So this is some effect which costs, say, some puzzle for a few months. Still another issue, what we had seen in tandem mix are ambiguities. So what you see here on the right is a digital elevation model here um, for some, some um, islands. And what you see here are these, uh, these waves here, these undulations. And you see it also here in the coherence image on the left. And the reason here, so we can, can look into the details here. This is an um, amplitude image of this area here on the left. You can then also look into the interferogram and the coherence. And you see here that here, this height structure here repeats in the interferogram here. And these are due to azimuth ambiguities. And in tandem X, this issue was resolved by reducing the process bandwidth, but you can, could also do some more sophisticated things, which may be relevant for harmony, the future. So you could see, um, use this information here and you have here and subtract it appropriately. So by this, um, we have a coherent remove, um, azimuth ambiguity removal in the interferograms. Just illustrated here with this example. Okay, then let me shortly talk about also about current and future developments by CDXR. So in Tandem X, the very first DEM we had acquired was, uh, say, um, already before the, all the commissioning phase and before the satellites were in close formation. So we had here the opportunity to get, acquire a large interfer a large baseline interferogram with a baseline of two kilometers, a height of ambiguity of 3.8 meters, very short height of ambiguity, which are very high, good height accuracy in the order of 10 to 20 centimeters, as you can see here. But what you see here is the stem generated from it. It's maybe accurate what you see here, this is ice flows, but it's not accurate what you see here, this is just fake. So you see here many the effects of, of um, face unwrapping uh, um, artifacts here. So this is not the true landscape here. And you see even with smaller baselines, you have this problem of the face unwrapping. So here are two examples with a height of ambiguity of 50 meters and 20 meters in tandem X. The left one is fine. You can produce a DEM. With the right one, you have this unwrapping errors. You measure the whole, the wrong height here some in this area, and say to resolve this issue, one could do in the future, say some more sophisticated things, one could have maybe um, um, not only two satellites, but three receiver satellites, 
as for example, in this tree nodal pendulum configuration shown here on the left. So the idea is that you have first evaluated data from the large baseline you have here between the satellites and use a rather dramatic approach. So there you don't have any ambiguities, height ambiguities, and you get maybe this accuracy, it's only a pretty poor accuracy. But then you can use a small baseline interferogram here. This has maybe a height of ambiguity of 100 meters, which is well above the accuracy of the geodramatic approach. So you can um, have, have no ambiguities here if you combine the images. And you get here this accuracy shown here, the dash lines. And then you can again use the large baseline interferogram shown here, which has maybe a height of ambiguity of 10 meters, but it was as well above the previous measurements with a small interferometric baselines. So by this, you can get end up with a very high um, accuracy, DM accuracy, by using these three satellite configuration. So a question is, however, say how one could one implement such kind of systems in a very efficient and cheap way in the end. And one approach here could be the mirror saw. The basic idea of mirror saw is the following. You have here a transmitter satellite, and then you have your receiver satellite. So, so, so this is, in this case, a semi-active configuration. So if several receiver satellites, but still they are typically complicated since you would need a demodulation, you need a storage, and you need um, also a downlink cap capability of the satellites. So it's much cheaper in the end and easier to just forward the signals here to the transmitter. So not to record the data, but just maybe to slightly modulate them, forward them to the transmitter, and then the, the transmitter can then combine the data in the end, demodulate them, combine them, and transmit them to the ground. But this, you can have very, very cheap receiver satellites and small receiver satellites also. And you could even um, um, add redundancy to the system by having some spare satellites here. You could also um, scale the system by having maybe not only one, but two transmitters to go more to a MIMO configuration. And by this, you can impl implement really multi based interferometry or even single pass tomography in a very cost effective manner. There are several ways how to implement this, this link from the um, receiver to the transmitter. Here, you could have an analog link. Say you just have an amplitude modulation here of the SAR signal on a high frequency carrier. It could be a high RF signal, high frequency RF signal, or it could even be an optical carrier in this case. Another option is that you have only, a, say, you only slightly sh um, sh modulate here, shift this, the frequency of the shift signal here by an additional oscillator here, but then you have maybe still the errors you introduce here. They're probably small if you have a small frequency shift, but they're maybe still more noticeable. So you could also um, add here a reference signal in here and by this, you could correct for this. So there are different options to implement this mirror link. And say this kind of concept, this mirror concept has also been proposed um, as a successor for Tandem X some years ago. So we had to uh, investigate the system up to a phase B1, but it has finally not been selected for implementation to, to say some, some other reasons. So this were no, no technical reasons in the end. Okay, and in the future, you can even think about systems with, with not only three receiver satellites, but even more to do single pass tomography. So um, you can really look, for example, in the forests. You see here maybe an example of what this may look like. So these interferograms may look like. Oh, it doesn't work. So you see here an area, a forest in the end, and some me me meadows. And you see here really, say in the forest, you can clearly see the vertical structure. You see the ground here. Say they, are, uh, they have a, a, a different polarization here, um, indicated by the color. And these are really unique data, which have in this case been acquired with our airborne radar system of DLR. So these are many monostatic acquisitions here. 
and say if you have this monostatic acquisitions, typically what you get, say if uh, you get also returns from direct scattering, but also from double bounds, for example, from the trees. And what you have here is typically say you get the effective phase center, which is here just um, at, the, at, at this point here, for example, and it's in the end the same for all acquisitions. If you have this double bound scattering here. If you have a bi-static configuration, say if you have one transmitter, multiple simultaneous receivers, situation looks a bit different. So you have here the situation, you transmit, get user reflection from the ground, reflection from this building in this case. And what you estimate then with the receivers is the direction of this point here. And if you would then interpret this as a single scatterer, you would say, okay, I have a scatterer from this direction here with this range. So you have a misinterpretation here. But you, what you measure here, you could, it's also the reverse path here. The same happens in this direction here. You get also a same point here. So you would estimate, say, um, in this situation here, you would get, a, say, say, a tomogram like this one here, with this configuration. So um, in this case, the virtual phase center approximation that you typically do, so you say, this is equivalent to a set of monostatic acquisitions. This approximation fails in this case of double or multiple bond scattering. What you can do, in, maybe also in the future, you can have multiple transmitters and receivers here, Simultaneously transmitting, so you go to a MIMO radar, and you have the MIMO star tomography. And by this, you have the great advantage in this case, in such a MIMO system here, distributed MIMO system, you can form both the receive beam and the transmit beam. And the interesting thing is, you can also form the transmit beam a posteriori, that is, after you have acquired the data. So by this, you can form, for example, a transmit beam in this direction after, st still from the data you have acquired, a posteriori. You transmit in this direction, receive in this direction. And by this, you can separate different scattering mechanisms. And you can, by this, re um, reconstruct here really the, say, the scene in this case. There are also some other options in the future, say distributed SAR imaging, you would maybe like to map very wide swaths with high resolution. So you could use, say, many receivers flying in the same track. So no, no interferometry or so at all here. It's just to um, avoid ambiguities if you use a low PRF. Or you could say have a high PRF with range ambiguities and suppress these range ambiguities by multiple um, satellites displaced in the cross track direction here. And both concepts can be used for high resolution by source imaging in the future. And say, uh, this has also been demonstrated with tandem mix, the first demonstration. So if you have a single image, you get maybe these ambiguities, the azimuth ambiguities. If you combine the images from multiple satellites or multiple phase centers here, you can avoid these ambiguities, get here the, the, only, uh, the original scatterer in the end. And this has also been demonstrated with uh, tandem mix. So here you see an image acquired with a single satellite. Here with, uh, say, a low PRF. So have, you have azimuth ambiguities, azimuth is in this direction, the vertical direction. You see here how the land repeats to the azimuth ambiguities. So you can use the phase centers from the single satellite to phase centers, so this becomes improves. You can also use the phase centers from the two satellites. Here also the ambiguity. Ambiguities are reduced. And if you combine all phase centers, you have here an optimum ambiguity suppression. But still what remains challenging is here you have still an ambiguity, this case. And this is due to the fact that here this ice flow moves during the acquisition, which is not considered in the reconstruction process. So if, since you have here this temporal distance between the acquisitions, a movement will not, will say, impede this is reconstruction in this case, and you have to do a more sophisticated processing. And in the long term, you may even think of to, to combine this wide swath techniques with linear beam forming here for suppressive range and azimuth ambiguities, and go to SAR interferometry and tomography together at the same time. So the whole idea is to combine this ambiguity suppression, for example, the azimuth ambiguity suppression with cross track interferometry or tomography, Say that, um, and the goal is that you can implement such systems with small distributed antennas. 
And what is still, say, there's still some work has to be done is to combine these two approaches in an optimum manner in order to really come with a uh, come up with a distributed cell system for tomography and, and multi-base and interferometry for high resolution and, and together with high resolution white source imaging. By this, you can then really observe on a global scale phenomena in forests, ice, snow, permafrost soils, and monitor really the 3D internal structure changes. Okay, then thank you for your attention. I hope you have got a first impression what you can do with bicycling and multistatics are, and also say what are the challenges and maybe also what are the current and future developments. Thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful, thank you <clears throat> so much for taking time. We have some questions in the chat. If you'd rather ask your questions verbally, you can raise your virtual hand. So uh, the first question that was entered in the chat is, how is it possible to estimate ship velocity in both range and cross range directions simultaneously? Mostly researchers consider one at a time. Okay, um, so maybe we go back to this example. Okay, so typically, say, um, in the SAR image, what been, say, maybe go back here, so sorry. Maybe go back here. So typically, where you're very sensitive in the, in the SAR, by having maybe two subsequent observations separated by a term, short time, this is radial movement. You see it here already, that you have here in the radial direction, if you have a movement, you also see a different range, and this, they are sensitive if you have a movement in this, say, in this azimuth direction here, you are insensitive. And um, so this is typical challenge, so you are, you are less sensitive, but you can, say, improve this, either if you have maybe multiple acquisitions also from different angles. So you could have, a, for example, a configuration where you have maybe here two closed satellites, and then maybe still two satellites say, um, with a, separate, um, a long -term separation of 100 kilometers and you get a different angle here. This is one solution. And this is, say, also something which is used in harmony in the end to get to measure ground deformation. Um, the other, say, opportunity is also you can, of course, see what you have here. If you have a long-term movement, you measure, have a different Doppler rate. And by this, you can also get, a, say, a cross estimate of the long track velocity. But it's say it's more it's less accurate than what you get what you get here with interferometry. Great. The next question says many thanks for your very interesting lecture. Do you have any comments on using pseudo noise ranging techniques relying on the TT and C subsystem to enforce coherency among SAR payloads in a multi-static configuration? Um, yes. So one can use this, this, this noise waveforms. This is, um, I agree. The, the point is, um, they they have often been um, also said by by using noise waveforms. You can also have maybe use multiple transmitters simultaneously, and you can then say correlate with the individual signals, and by this can implement some some kind of MIMO configuration. Um, the problem is this, is this works typically perfectly if you have point-like scatterers. So if you would like, for example, the, the, um, monitor the ocean um, um, and see ships, I'm pretty sure that it will work fine. But if you have distributed targets, the noise you generate from the other waveforms will always appear again in, in, in the image. So it's will, will, for distributed targets, it will be difficult to separate the signals from these um, waveforms. But in the end, so noise is, uh, say, if you do not intend this MIMO applications, it is for me, it could be used in the end. So it's, um, I don't have objections. And it's maybe also an interesting topic for the future to really combine, for example, as a communication signals with, um, with uh, radar signals to use, uh, say, to have a kind of dual use here. Great. Uh, another question is a little more specific, and it asks what kind of phase preserving modulation is used. Okay, so um, what is meant here? Yeah, it refers to the mirror saw.
So to press to the slide in the end, by its written uh, RX signal forwarding by phase preserving modulation to avoid synchronization link. And it's really, say, one option is here really shown in the, on this slide. So what is here really, you have the RF signal from the ground that you see here. And then one way is really to modulate the signal on a high frequency carrier. So think of first maybe of an optical link even. Then of course you don't have, say the phase of this carrier doesn't matter at all. Phase, whether it's red light or green light or whether it's a shift even doesn't matter. You make us, it's really an amplitude modulation here. But it could also be a high frequency RF signal. So if you're L band, you see a KA band, this would work as well. And you have only to detect the envelope. So by this, you don't introduce an error here because if you have your phase errors from the carrier. Okay. This is one option. The other option is maybe shown here. So you, if you have maybe here acquired a signal, say an X-band, and then you would have many receivers, so you cannot simply forward it. You have to shift it in frequency in order to separate the signals from different receivers. So you could have a small modulation. This, of course, is adds less sensitive, uh, less error than if you would have a complete demodulation, for example. So it's maybe only a shift by, by, by a few hundred megahertz. But still, there may, may remain errors, and then you have maybe to think about, say, some solutions to resolve this error, as, as has been suggested here, that I introduce, say, still a reference signal. Maybe this has be, become a bit more clear. So the first, the first one is a really, say, I think you are insensitive to the, to the error. So it's a face-preserving link in the end. Wonderful. I think we have time for one more, which is great, because we had one more in the chat. And it says, in case you want to introduce passive SAR CubeSats in an already existing SAR illuminator, where the illuminator has no ISL, only communicates to the ground, how would you propose to communicate and synch a, a communication and synchronization architecture? Also, if with the passive SAR CubeSats, you want to do both a long track and a cross track interferometry, in interferometry, how would you propose the formation of the structure of the orbit? So I guess those are two Pretty separate questions, but from the same person. Okay, good. I, I think I need some time to, to read the question and understand it clearly. So, um, well, um, there's no bias or uh, this is the right link is one here. Okay. Uh, so maybe see in this case it, it's of course difficult but maybe you can um you can try to to record the signals from the transmitter to get say some from side lobes or so it depends on the antenna um structure and then the other thing is um you can, of course, also try to do then some sophisticated processing um, of the SAR data. So in the SAR data, there is information on this phase. So this is a systematic error in the SAR images and in the ferrograms. And for example, in this autosync approach, which I had shortly mentioned, which is also demonstrated by my colleague, um, Marco Diggis Casola, you could maybe also have then, say, some option to, to avoid the phase errors there. Well, great. Well, we have hit the hour and should give everyone, you know, time to move on to their next thing. But thank you again for making time to present here. I'll remind everyone that this is every month at this time. Uh, we currently have speakers lined up, I think, through September. Um, but if you are interested in giving a presentation or know someone who you would like to, uh, please tell them to either respond to the e email uh, announcing this or to contact me directly. Thanks again.